Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Randy Gage. Do you feel out of balance in your life, like your family and your work are your priorities, but you don't have enough time in the day, so you're shortchanging them both? Not to mention wanting to work out more or, or do more of the things that you love. Are you easily distracted and you want to be able to stay more focused so that you can lock in on the most important things that you know you should be doing? You want to be more consistent so you can achieve those goals that always seem just out of reach. Or maybe you feel like you just lack the motivation that it takes to get there. Or maybe you're just not clear on what the right first step actually is. Like every time you're about to take action, you doubt whether or not it's the right action or the right goal. I know the feeling. I've got a wife and four kids, I have a job, a rental property, this podcast, not to mention the inevitable challenges that just come up with life like you know illness and struggling family members or car trouble. I've got a lot going on, but when I was a Division One All-American athlete, I was completely locked in. I was focused. I was balanced, and I knew exactly what I wanted and the steps that I had to take to get it, but when I got into the real world, things got a lot more complex. There's just a lot more time demands. Like Everything seems to be a priority. How are you supposed to figure out what's the right next step for you? Well, I've developed a system that helps you do just that. Find the balance, the clarity, the focus that you're looking for so you can take your life to the next level. So you can start seeing the dreams that are in your mind as realistic goals and have a plan to achieve them. I've opened a few spots on my calendar for free 30-minute strategy calls so you can take that first step toward the life that you've always dreamed about. Just one simple step, one small commitment that will give you huge results, a simple phone call that will leave you with a plan. If you want this life, if you want to truly have a breakthrough, claim one of the few spots, open on my calendar, and I'll share with you the formula that has had people who I work with saying things like one of my recent coaching clients, Frank, who said, my only regret is that I didn't do this 20 years ago. Or like Isaac, who said, I love this version of myself the best, and I'll do anything to keep it going. I've got dozens more quotes like that. If you want to feel the same way, go to jimharshawjr.com slash apply. That's jimharshawjr.com slash apply. Randy is a New York Times bestselling author and member of the Speakers Hall of Fame. A high school dropout, Randy rose from a jail cell as a teen to becoming a successful multimillionaire. Randy is the author of 11 books translated into 25 languages. He has spoken to more than 2 million people across more than 50 countries. He's a thought-provoking, critical thinker who will make you approach your life in a whole new way. And when he's not prowling the podium or locked in his lonely writer's garret, you'll probably find him playing third base for a softball team somewhere, but maybe not anymore, actually. We just got, I just got the news that he is, uh, as of about a week ago, retired. So we'll talk about that briefly. But as usual for the listener, if you don't have time to listen to this entire episode or if you hear something you like but you don't have a chance to write it down, make sure you grab your free copy of the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action, and you'll actually get access to action plans from every single episode before this as well. So jimharshawjr.com slash action. Randy, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be on with you. So you mentioned that you had been on a team that won the softball World Series last year. You went back at it again this year to try to defend the title. You guys finished fourth, and uh, you're retired. Is that right? It's time. <laughs> it's time. Your body's speaking to you. It's, yeah, it was probably time a couple of years ago. I've <laughs> got uh, spinal stenosis. I did four of the laser spine surgeries and um, certainly improved my 
the amount of pain I was in, but it's just, uh, and I'm going to be 60 in my next birthday. Six wow. Old, really? So I've had like a good it. run, but I think it's time to hang up the cleats and just coach the beginners. <laughs> yeah. Well, for any of my listeners who follow me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, you'll see a picture of Randy. And uh, my goodness, you don't look anywhere near 60. So you're doing pretty good. Get out. You got a few more years in you, Randy. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hopefully I've got another 40, 50 on the plan. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. at some point you just, and you know, I, I realize this whole podcast, everybody listening, we're always talking about um, uh, failure as a stepping stone of success and learning from failures. And part of that is sometimes knowing, hey, okay, I'm not going to be the next president. I'm not going to be a rock star. I'm not going to, my body doesn't really, uh, it isn't going to allow me to be an Olympic athlete, uh, Olympic triathlon or something, but no, and okay. So, but what is the lesson I can learn from that? What is the other door that's opening in my life that this is directing me to? And uh, for me, softball, I've loved it. I've played it at a really high level for 20 years. Um, won a lot of big, uh, big tournaments and games and titles. And and it's time to move on. And now I, uh, you know, I'll coach and show beginners how to play the game right and how to get the best out of it. But you also have to understand, hey, there's some things that uh, are not meant to be, but they lead us. To something else that's meant to be. Well, let's turn that into a question for the podcast here and for the listeners. How do we know when to say when? How do we know when to quit? Because quitting is something that, you know, you never quit. You keep pushing. You always keep going. But also, there's this idea that there are some things that you have to say no to. And, and I, I believe that every, you know, if you say yes to one thing, that inherently means you're saying no to something else. Or if you say no to one thing, that means you're saying yes to something else. So, how do you do that? How do you figure out what that is? How do you figure out what is the what are the right things to say yes to? What are the right things to say no to? How do we how do we know when to to say to quit? That's a tough question and I my answer, I have one that works for me. It may not work for everyone. It may upset some people or think that I'm uh, being negative, but I, I'm a baseball guy, right? So I do three strikes and you're out. If I'm really attempting something and three times the universe shows me in some way, this is not for you. I say, you know, I'm supposed to do something else. Now that doesn't mean three little bumps in the road or three little, but I mean, if I'm trying one thing and it, it really does fail three times, then I, the universe has probably told me, hey, that's not the right thing for you. Yeah. And I, I, hate to, I hate to say that because I know some people will take that as negative that, well, you know, Abraham Lincoln, you know, ran seven times and then he or Walt Disney <laughs> went bankrupt seven times. And then, and you know what? That that could have been true for some things for me that sure. maybe if I did do them seven times or 27 times or 97 times. But you just got to find a line at some point. You say, well, that's my line for me because maybe I would have done something I tried if I failed 87 times but you know what maybe maybe my life would have been miserable for <laughs> 20 years during those 87 times and the payoff really wouldn't have been worth it so yeah, and it's interesting because the, pay, the payoff has to be worth it and that allowed you know saying saying no to those things when you fail three times saying no allows you to say yes to something else so it's it's uh, like I said, it's a trade off, and that's such a tough question to answer, right? And the the best answer I probably have ever heard to that question, I, I don't know that I have a great answer to that question, is, but uh, Travis Macy, who I had on in episode fifty two, he says, whenever whenever what you're trying to do no longer aligns with your values and no longer aligns with who you are and what you want, I thought that was a good answer. But man, there's a uh, there's a lot of different takes on that. Yeah, and, and and I'd agree with him on that. Even if it's one time, if you sign, hey, no, that really doesn't align with my values anymore. Hey, it's time to move on. Yeah, sure. And so let's go back further, Randy. Tell us about your background. You know, where'd you grow up, and kind of give us a thirty thousand foot view of how you got from there to where you're at now. 
I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, a uh, single child, uh, middle child of a single mother who was raising three kids by herself back when not many women were doing that. And she was doing that knocking on doors, selling Avon. And I mean, back in the day when you literally did knock on doors to sell Avon. And uh, she worked amazing and hard, and I was probably the worst child and put her through such ordeals, made a lot of bad choices, teenage alcoholic, teenage drug addict. I was in jail at 15 for armed robbery. Uh, so I certainly made some poor choices. Um, I'd like to say I think I make some better ones now. <laughs> Not all of them, but, <laughs> but the, the the path has certainly redirected itself, and I've been able to live a very blessed life, and I'm grateful for that. Um, but it, uh, yeah, it was a journey along the way, and I, I was a, you know, started as a minimum wage dishwasher and became a cook and a busboy and then an assistant manager and manager, and then uh, got my own place, which ultimately failed, but was a good lesson along the way. Um, and got into marketing, uh, got into direct marketing, direct selling, uh, started writing books, speaking about it, uh, and kind of gravitated toward the mental aspect of the game, uh, which is always what's fascinating me about softball or any other sport as well. I, I really do believe 90% of it is mental. Uh, and so I kind of really the last 20 to 30 years, that's what my work has all been about, the mental aspect of success. So you obviously made a major shift from teenage alcoholic, drug addict, and armed robbery, going doing armed robbery. I mean, what was, how, how did that shift happen? I mean, what happened? I mean, you know, obviously, if you, you think of a kid or you see a kid in that situation today, you don't look at him and go, wow, that's going to be, that guy's going to be, he's going to be writing best selling books. He's going to be a millionaire. How'd you make that shift? What happened there? I got the greatest gift. One of the, uh, my best buddy in school was dating a girl. Her father was a teacher at another school. And she got her father, you got to go help Randy. Randy's in jail. You know, you got to go see him, see what you could do. So he came to see me. Uh, his name was Baxter Richardson, and he, he, he so he's speaking to me in my cell, and he says to me, you don't belong here. You're capable of great things. And I'm like, who's this? Does this guy know who he's talking to? <laughs> you know, you, you're, okay, I'm capable of great things. Who is this guy? You know, where is he coming from? And he persisted. He like, I called your teachers. I'm a teacher, so I called your teachers. They told me you skip school for three weeks straight and then you come and you pass a test. Your reading comprehension is above college level. You could do amazing things. And nobody had ever said anything like that to me. That was just crazy talk at first to me. But I was so desperate to believe it that I believed it. And because I believed it, it was true, right? I mean, I think that's the case for us sometimes. I was so desperate to believe it, I believed it. And because I believed it, it became true. So you started living it out. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I'd love to say I snapped my fingers and then I was a millionaire when I was 17 and everything was perfect. No, of course not. It was a journey. And I had steps along the way, but I really did say, hey, yeah, I think I can make better choices in life. And uh, he vouched for me. I had a job lined up. Other people vouched for me. So I was able to get probation instead of continuing uh, to rot away in jail. Um, Baxter was actually a teacher at an alternative high school. They were testing out called the School Without Walls. And where, let's say you wanted to be an electrician, you would apprentice with an actual electrician and things like that. So I, I did that. I got a job and I just, I was able to, I didn't finish high school, but I just went out in the workforce and uh, really was able to turn my life around. 
And what do you say to the person who is listening, who maybe doesn't think that they're worthy of that level of success? Maybe they, maybe they, you know, maybe they're not in jail right now, but maybe they're, maybe they're in some way, there's all kinds of proof around them that, that they can't succeed. Right. And, and Maybe they've they've tried to start a business but it failed. Maybe, you know, they've had failure in their past. Maybe they have a broken relationship or they're overweight or they want to maybe, you know, gosh, maybe they want to write a best selling book and but they wrote a book and it was just and it, and it didn't really sell. I mean what there's all kinds of proof around them that says you're not worthy of that level of success that you dream of. And you know, you were there and you had that moment and somebody else planted that seed in you. But, so what do you say to that person who's listening right now that, that is feeling not, not worthy of, of this level of success that they dream about? I, my blog today is about worthiness issues. I have done a, I've been doing a series. So I started last week and because uh, I have a high level coaching program, I consult with companies and people and really high level achievers, millionaires and billionaires elite athletes, uh, political leaders. And I see the same patterns over and over. And I was said, you know, how, how would I categorize them? And I broke it into the five deadliest causes of failure. And I said, I'm going to do this five part series on the blog about it. Well, it just consumed me. <laughs> it's been just weeks of my life. Uh, and I said, there's no way I could do this in five posts because some of these <laughs> posts were uh, six pages, eight pages long. And I said, when I got to this one, the worthiness issue one, which is cause number one, I said, this post to be longer than a surfboard. <laughs> so I'm breaking <laughs> it down. So it's like a continuing series. It's probably going to be eight or 10 posts total. And that's the number one cause is worthiness issues. And yeah. It's really important people understand that because you said something very critical for people listening, Jim, which was, you know, if you have all this proof around you that, no, that's not proof. That's misleading evidence. And I actually wrote an entire book about a subject of mind viruses, which is uh, the science of memetics or memes. When people hear the word meme, they think now it's a, it's a catchy slide on Instagram because that's they kind of hijacked sure. the term. But meme was actually uh, uh, developed by Richard Dawkins in his book, The Selfish Gene. And a meme refers to a mind virus. And just like you get a virus on your computer, you can get a, a virus in your mind, in your subconscious mind. And the most prevalent mind viruses in the world our money is bad, rich people are evil, it's noble to be poor, to be successful, you got to be a bad parent. If a company is really successful, it's because they're exploiting the little guy and pillaging the environment and exploiting low labor and all these negative memes about money and sure. success. And uh, so I wrote a whole book about it, about it. The, the guiltiest parties are the government, organized religion, and what I call the data sphere, TV, radio, movie, internet, social movie, social media. Uh, they propagate all these memes. And so what happens is you have this subconscious programming that you don't know is there that says rich people are evil. On a conscious level, you're trying to be successful. So you write that book or you launch that company or you approach that uh, big client that you think would be a, a grand slam for you. And it doesn't work because you actually self-sabotage yourself. Sure. And the, people say, because uh, the point I make in, in the post today is that your core foundational beliefs about all the important stuff, Money, God, sex, work, relationships, marriage. You have those beliefs by the time you're 10 years old. And most people never go back and question the premise and say, well, what is my belief on that? When did I get it? Is it true? And so people all the time say to me, are you telling me I'm self-sabotaging myself at 40 years old from a promotion? 
because of a belief I developed when I was six or seven? And the answer is absolutely yes. So uh, I hope you guys listening to go back and read that that series of blogs and just look at, okay, what is what are the core foundational beliefs that I have about money and success and health and relationships? And uh, realize that maybe you have negative dysfunctional beliefs and you're sabotaging your own success because that proof that you're not supposed to be successful is a false proof positive. You are supposed to be successful. We we are designed as a species to grow up and be healthy and happy and prosperous. And if you, but it's all mental. If you get on the wrong track and you have a bad premise, everything that comes off that premise is going to be bad. So to identify that premise for the listener, we've talked about this before. It's, you know, productive pause. It's a short period of focused reflection around specific questions that leads to clarity of action and peace of mind. So, so you get these insights from hitting the pause button on your life, looking back at your life, trying to identify what are these memes? What are these premises that I've, I've used to make decisions and, and take actions on my own whole life and maybe self sabotaging myself from success? So you first got to do the productive pause, but I'll turn this back to you, Randy. Then what, right? Then what? So I identify that, okay, when I was 10 years old, this, you know, these are the people who were in my life or this was planted in my, in my mind. And I've always believed this, you know, I, some of the things that you've talked about right there, you know, rich people are bad and, you know, companies that are successful, exploit their workers, et cetera. How do you, how do you then, how do you then make the shift? How do you replace that? Yeah. I think 70% of it, maybe 80% of it is recognizing that programming is there. Because for most people, we'll call it subconscious, call it unconscious. They really don't know that belief is there. But once you get it out of the dark and into the light and you realize, oh, wow, I really do have a belief that it's noble or spiritual to be poor. And that I've had this subconscious operating system that if I struggle and and be live in poverty for my whole life, then I'm going to get a better reward in the afterlife. And you realize, wow, that is just sick and twisted. And that is sabotaging me. So you recognize the belief and then you've got to replace it with an empowering belief of, hey, I am meant to live a prosperous life. And then you have to reprogram again, because the, the point of that, that book, by the way, the, the title you know gets people, because the title is Why You're Dumb, Sick, and Broke, <laughs> and How to Get Smart, Healthy, and Rich. So it's really a in-your-face kind of title. But a bit. The, the <laughs> yeah, the thing in the book was the the, the point I, I'm I'm showing people is just like it's example after example after example of the pop culture TV shows, of the pop culture movies, of the novels. We go back to the operas from Puccini. We can go back to two thousand years ago, the hero's journey and Joseph Campbell and mythology. And I can show you for thousands of years. This programming about money bad, rich people evil, spiritual to be poor, blah, blah, blah. And you realize you're being programmed with that negative programming 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, Examples I like to give the, the, you know, Hollywood, they'll they'll spend a hundred million dollars making a movie and it'll bomb, right? And it's how could we have known? And I was, I'm always like, Hey, send me the script and five grand. I'll read your script and I'll tell you if this movie will be a hit or a miss. And I'm never wrong. And why am I huh. never wrong? I, so I could look at Crazy Rich Asians, which I haven't seen yet, but I definitely sure. want to see because I love the actors. I knew that there was like, oh, it's a big risk. It's all Asian cast. And will it play in America? I looked at the trailer, you know, the commercials. and I'm like, that's going to be a big hit. Because it makes fun of rich people. And people <laughs> love movies that make fun of rich people. Yeah. Uh, Succession on HBO. 
the actors in it were good. I saw the traders. I'm like, wow, I got to watch that. That looks amazing. So I watched two and a half episodes and then I shut it off, turned off the programming that, you know, to record it every week and say, I don't ever want to watch this again because it's so much negative programming about, you know, usually there's like some nuance. If you look back to shows like Dallas and Dynasty and Beverly Hillbillies, no matter what your generation, I can show you the television shows of your time. There's usually some nuance. We have J.R. Ewing, who's the evil, bad guy, you know, money grubbing, evil, rich guy. And then you had Bobby Ewing, who was a kind, compassionate. But I looked at that, watched this show, Succession, and every single wealthy person was the most despicable, conniving, evil, nasty, bad parent, bad grandparent, yeah. bad person. And I wrote, so I wrote a blog about it, and I said, man, this show is going to be a big hit. And of course it is. So I could look at any script and just say, if you pander to those negative memes, it's a hit. You know what? When you, when you watch them, it makes you feel virtuous. Like, exactly. Wow. makes you feel good. It makes you feel like, oh, at least I'm not that. Yeah. Like, yeah. And it makes I you feel better about your, your lack of, of success. And well, you know, gosh, I don't want to be rich because... That's what rich people are like, right? For example. Exactly. 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 Yeah. And, and we all know, for the listener, I mean, and you too, Randy, like we know people who are rich in conniving and poor in conniving and middle class in conniving, right? I mean, those, yeah. that, that, that personality trait exists everywhere. And, and so it's not just, it's not just one, one uh, wealth category. You know, I, I go back to, Episode 15, it was Seth Goldman. I, he's the CEO of Honest Tea. And he's a guy who's fit. He's a great dad, prioritizes family. Uh, he's extremely successful. And his company is green. And, and they don't, you know, they're, they, they work with indigenous uh, uh, growers, et cetera, overseas. And it, he's, he's, he's doing all of that, right? So you can, Mm-hmm. You can find there. There's plenty. I mean, gosh, I just I picked that one example. There's there's plenty of those examples. Right, but right? If, if, you, if you make a movie about him, it's not really a hit. Yeah, no, of course. But if you turn you, him into you a bad guy, a, maybe a movie about an evil guy doing that, it's sure. a big hit. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So I think uh, you've got to you got to look around and, and and you 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 believe what you want to believe and you and you find what you want to find. If you want to find. You know, those bad things, those negative things, you can find those. If you want to find the positives, you can find those. So I guess that's in, leads me to right. my next. So let's, let's, let's elaborate on that effect, Jim, because I yeah, think please. it's really important for the, the, the people listening right now. If we watch a Red Sox-Yankees game and there's a bang-bang play at first base, uh, all the Yankees fans are going to say he's safe and all the Red Sox fans are going to say he's out. <laughs> yeah. Every time they show the replay, right? Yep. And you say, well, they're over and over. the same how do they see this? Of course. The, the complete opposite thing. Yeah. Confirmation bias. Uh, you can't help it. If you're a Red Sox fan and that's Mookie busting down the line, you think he's safe. You, you just can't help it. It's confirmation bias. If you're a Yankee fan, you're saying, oh, my God, Gregorius made such an amazing throw. He got him by a hundredth of a step. It's confirmation bias. And so when you have... This comp- that's why when you say, yeah, you believe what you want to believe, you see what you want to see, it's because that confirmation bias exists in your subconscious mind. Yep, absolutely. It's, it's plain as day. I mean, you can see that. And uh, we, we've, all, we've all been there. We've all done that. So, Randy, you've written about people like Steve Jobs, Richard Branson, Mark Cuban, you know, just really successful people and how they think differently. What what can we learn from them? These are people who have done, you know, had unthinkable amounts of success. How do we get inside their head? What can we learn from them? They really understand the theme of your whole podcast, that failure is a stepping stone to success. They understand. I always like to use the venture capitalist uh, in analogy because I think it's helpful to people. Um, I know a lot of your guests, you always say, Hey, if you, if you had any failure that you had to overcome and you haven't asked me that yet, fortunately, because I would need <laughs> we're a, getting there. We're getting 10 there. hours, well, I need <laughs> 10 hours 
with that one, right? So like my first restaurant, that failed, right? And I remember borrowing a car from a friend of mine and driving up because I didn't have a car. I, my business was seized by the IRS, right? And they auctioned it off for the unpaid taxes I had. And I'm driving up I-95 in my friend's borrowed car, just crying, thinking, how am I going to tell my mother? I was like the the first entrepreneur in my family, the first person who had a business who didn't work for somebody for a paycheck. Everybody in my family is proud of me. And now I've failed and I'm just crying, uh, driving up the you know highway. And a venture capitalist would never do that. In other words, they've got a fund they're going to invest. They, they pick 100 investments and they know that 98% of them are going to fail. And hopefully... Two of them are going to become unicorns and be worth a billion dollars, right? Sure. Or one of them be a unicorn. And, you know, five or ten will be moderate success and, you know, at least they'll they'll get their investment back and make some profit. And they're hoping that the, the big hits outplay the failures, which they do for a smart investor, right? Somebody who's savvy. And they don't see those, let's say, the 98 that don't make it, as long as the founder keeps them up to breath. Here's what's going on. And then if they get a letter from the fund, they know, and they were tracking the money, the burn rate and the progress. And then they get a letter from the, you know, an email or a text. And it's like, Hey, you know what? We've decided the mark, you know, the app doesn't have traction. We're going to shut it down. There's only 10% of the capital left and we're returning it. And every venture, venture capitalist investor in the world will tell you, great. They did their best. We tested it. We found out the market didn't like that. And they would, 99 times out of 100, they'll probably reinvest in that entrepreneur again because <clears throat> they were honest with them. They communicated. They kept, and they gave their best effort. And they're smart enough to know, hey, okay, the market isn't ready for this yet, or it's not the right product for the market. And I think the lesson those guys that we've talked about, I mean, read Branson's book. Right? There's a one of his uh, early books, I remember, there's a part where you know he got a visit from a banker on a Friday night. He said, "Wow, why are you coming to my house?" And it's because the guy was, uh, you know, taking, you know, killing his line of credit and going after the business. <laughs> yeah, um, they all face those kind of things, but they don't. As Cuban says, you only have to be right one time. And we tend to personalize these failures, but if you approached it like a VC gal would, which is, okay, that, you know, we tested this concept out. It didn't really take in the market. So we're going to rework and come back and try something else. That's what I think those, the, the ones you, the people you mentioned, that's what I think they do. And that's what I think would be good advice for all of us. You know, I looked at your Twitter profile this morning. Just, uh, you posted the, the this quote. You said your next mistake will take you one step closer to your goal. Right. If you will learn from it and not personalize and like, oh, my God, I made a mistake. My life is over. No. OK. What did I learn from this mistake that allow me to get to where I ultimately want to go? Yeah. So let's go down that road with you. I mean, you shared one story of failure there. Is there maybe another story you can share that? That is a story of failure because we look at a guy like you who who obviously went from from a troubled background, troubled teen to where you're at now. But um, we just look at you and go, "Wow, man, this guy he 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 knows how to create success and 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 everything he's done at least recently in his life and everything he's going to do in the future is going to be a success, a resounding success because of where he's at and what he's done, etc." But that's not necessarily the case. So, can you share another story about failure that uh, maybe brought you that that self doubt and that that discouragement that, uh, that we all face and how you overcame that. Yeah, I did it with restaurants twice. I was a manager for a, a national franchise and then I thought I got to get my own place. And so I leased a uh, seafood places and, uh, thought I'm going to have my own restaurant and I'm going to do restaurant consulting. And so I uh, partnered with my assistant manager and we set up a shop and, 
who took an ad in the Wall Street Journal for in the classified for restaurant consulting, and we hired a receptionist to answer all the calls that were going to come streaming in from this classified <laughs> ad. <laughs> and then we leased this uh, place and we hired a manager to do it because I didn't manage it because, of course, it was an hour drive away and I was going to be, you know, consulting with all these clients we we're going to get. And I mean, we just lost our shirts in it. We hired a manager and the, the guy was actually keeping 80% of the gate and, you know, re- reporting these ridiculous figures. And I learned a lot of lessons from that. Right. And then the, the other restaurant where it was seized by the IRS, I learned, you know, I didn't have the money. I didn't have enough money to launch. I launched before I should have. Right. And so I didn't have the, the money to get me through the trials and tribulations. But that was another lesson that I learned that, okay, that and, and today is so much easier to raise money. I mean, there's so much money out there looking for investments, but I didn't <clears throat> realize that at the time, right? You evolve and grow and learn. Um, but it's, I don't, you know, how many people honestly learn breakthrough lessons from success. Yeah, no, that's I right. It, I don't think it's many. Don't. I think, yeah, for most people, our breakthrough lessons are the ones we learn from our failures. And you've written the book on that. I mean, risky is the new safe. You have to take a risk to to create success, to learn, to move forward, right? Yeah, if you think, well, if I lay low and you know, keep my head below the cubicle, don't make any waves, uh, in Australia, they call it the tall poppy syndrome, which is, hey, the tall flowers are the first ones that get picked. Uh-huh. So don't be the tall flower. Um, the, you're just roadkill today. You just you have to be willing to stand out. you got to be willing to put yourself out there because that's where the real breakthroughs are. So, Randy, let me ask you a few questions to really bring this home for the listener as, as we wrap up here. So what are some habits that you've had that you do and that have carried you through the years and brought you success? Any key habits or core habits that you have or you do? Yeah, I do daily self-development time, listening to podcasts, reading books, something to feed my mind, body, soul every single day. I do daily exercise cardiovascular exercise. Um, <clears throat> I clean, I empty my email box every night before I go to bed, before I shut down. Um, and I always kind of plan my next day. In other words, I, before I, you know, I, I have the office, I work from home. Um, and then when I shut down, I shut down because I don't work till the moment I go to bed or I know my brain's going to be churning for hours and hours. So at whatever point I decide to stop for the day. That's it. And then I turn off and I don't uh, answer my phone. I don't answer my emails. I clean my email and that's it. I'm done. And then anything else will roll over till tomorrow. And then I just, <clears throat> I take uh, two minutes and kind of scan, look at my appointment book and what I have planned for tomorrow and what do I want to get done tomorrow. And so I've kind of got that percolating in my subconscious mind uh, when I wake up the next day. And those Simple habits I, I make all the difference in the world for me. I, I think they, they, I'm just, I think I'm more productive than any 10 people I know. I mean, I get so much done. Uh, you know, Saturday, I was like, I wrote four blog posts. I did two podcasts. I did uh, four prosperity TV videos. I cleaned my email. I wrote a, a proposal for a, you know, a, a a storyboard for a video script. I mean, in a day I did what some people don't do in 10 days. Right. But I think it's because of those habits I have that really allow me to be so productive. Yeah. Simple core habits. That's, that's what I find all successful people have. And and they're very similar, you know, personal development, exercise, planning. These are all the essential core habits that I hear over and over and over. So, Randy, what if the action the listener says, "Well, what's an action item I can do in the next twenty-four to forty-eight hours? What 
what would you recommend? I mean, maybe it's just those things exactly that you told us, you know, playing tomorrow, today, you know, inbox zero, exercise, personal development. But what would you recommend? If there's one action item you can recommend for the listener, what would you recommend for the next 24 to 48 hours? Let's begin with what you just said. Any one of those habits I have that you don't have, if you adopted that, that will help you for sure. Um, On top of that, I would say, because I can't answer this in the general, because there are people listening who are salespeople and there are lead people listening who are entrepreneurs and people who are managers. And so I don't know the specific action, but what I would say is find a specific goal that would be, you know, an intermediate goal that would be the next step in your journey and then give yourself a reward for that. So I love to do that for myself. When I'm writing a book, I'm like, okay, so I'm going to, I've got to finish chapter three and then I can get a massage. I got to finish chapter four and then I get to eat lunch. (laughs) I give myself a reward. And the bigger the thing, like when the book published, so when I get this book finished, I'm going to buy myself a new car, right? The, I make the reward uh, relative to the action. Sure. So if you, yeah, everybody listening, just think about, okay, so here's my ultimate goal. Okay. You want to take your company public. You want to be a billionaire. You want to write an opera. You want, okay. But what's one stair step goal, an achievable goal that requires some stretch, that requires some effort, requires some, some guts. And then what would be the reward you'll give yourself for getting there? Yeah. Set that up. And, and I think that'd be a, a good action to take. Yeah, that's great. That creates momentum. Excellent. Can you recommend a tool or a technology or maybe a an app or a supplement or, or anything like that that you use? It could be technology. It can be otherwise. Anything that helps you be more effective, Randy? Yeah, they're both about podcasts. One is the Apple Podcast button on the iPhone. Just, I love it. It's just revolutionized for me because I just wasn't, you know, go find a podcast, download it on iTunes, whatever. It just, but with this podcast app that Apple built in the iPhone, I just, now I'm subscribed to six or seven different podcasts. And I just, every day I get, hey, new episode on this, new episode on that. Uh, so I can take it and, you know, I do it when I'm working out or when I'm driving or whatever. So that's really enhanced my ability to process good content. And then as a podcast uh, producer, I got to say the Anchor podcast app is just a breakthrough app for people who want to do a podcast. It's a kind of one-stop shopping that anyone can get their podcast set up. You record it right on your phone, and it's just magical, I think. So I love that, uh, that app as well. Cool. Yeah, I don't use that, but I uh, actually came across that not long ago. Sounds pretty good. And w- Randy, what's your favorite podcast? Got a couple of favorite podcasts, actually, that you can recommend? Gary V is, uh, uh, it's going to be a little repetitive if you listen to it long term, but I-, I love the, I like his because when he gets into, does a lot of Q&A, of course, at his talks, does a lot of Q&A on his Ask Gary V show. And when he's just ripping on an answer, he will just give you some of the most breakthrough stuff. Uh, Seth Godin has a, his is called a Kimbo. Uh, again, a real thoughtful guy. Um, so Seth, Seth is obviously a lot more laid back than Gary V. Sure. Two different guys, but two really great podcasts in terms of content. Excellent. Excellent. For the listener, we'll have links to those in the action plan. Again, Jim com slash action. Randy, take a minute to promote yourself. Where can we find you, follow you, learn more about your books, etc.? RandyGage.com. That's kind of my Starfleet command site. And then I'm everywhere on social media. Just search me on any of Google, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Insta. I'm on them all. Excellent. For the listener, we'll have links to all those in the action plan. So just click over there, grab your your copy, and uh, you'll be all set. Randy, thank you so much for making time to come on the show. 
Thanks. This was a great interview, a great conversation. I'm glad I got a chance to connect with everybody here. Excellent. Likewise, thanks for sharing your wisdom, Randy. And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. Don't forget what I talked about before the interview. If you want to find balance, clarity, and focus, take the next step and go to jimharshawjr.com slash apply. Space on my calendar is very limited, so claim your spot now. jimharshawjr.com slash apply.